Welcome, everybody. Um, very warm welcome to this open lecture hall, Stockholm Plus 50, Five Decades of Global Environmental Governance. It was 50 years ago that governments met for the first time for an international summit to uh, collectively address global environmental problems. Since then, 50 years ago, um, the world has witnessed many environmental summits and appeals for sustainable development. Most recently, the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. My name is Lena Part. I'm the new professor of comparative politics here at the Otto Zoo Institute. And I organized this public lecture series um, to take stock with you of five decades of global environmental governance. And today we will start with uh, climate change politics. And for me, it's a great honor that Miranda Schroyas um, gives the first lecture today on yeah, climate politics. Miranda will speak for about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session, which um, I organized together with uh, Johanna and Caroline. And Miranda, before the floor is yours, the two are going to present you. Uh, Miranda is a political scientist and current professor at the TUM, Technical University of Munich, where she holds a chair for environmental and climate policy. She was born in the U.S. and achieved her academic career there in Washington first and then in Michigan, where she received her Ph.D. in comparative politics. She started teaching in Maryland and then combined teaching and research while moving from the US to the Netherlands, Japan, Norway, and finally here to Germany, like in Berlin at FU uh, and in Munich. Uh, parallelly, uh, she has been a valuable advisor on several environmental related committees of the German federal government, among which she was asked in 2011 by Angela Merkel to be a member of the Ethics Committee for a Secure Energy Supply. For all these reasons and many more, it is a real honor to have her here to discuss the 30th UN's SDG about climate change. Um, so now, can you? So hello everyone, um, what a pleasure to be back. I used to teach in this room and uh, so for me it brings back many memories. And I would also like to just take one minute and to introduce Martin Jeneke who is sitting there. Martin, can you raise your hand? Martin Jeneke is actually the founder of environmental studies at the Freie Uni Berlin. And um, I think without him, I wouldn't be here because I came here as a graduate student and I did some of my field research for my dissertation when Martin Jeneke held the chair for um, comparative politics. And then I came and I'm really happy that now Lena Parch has taken on the position here because um, it's a wonderful opportunity to continue a tradition of uh, research and study into uh, sustainable sustainability issues and climate change issues. So I have way too many slides. They tell you never to do what I'm about to do, but I'm going to race you through a lot of time, a lot of issues, a lot of countries. And feel free to interrupt at any time if you have questions. So just real quickly here, I want to show you that uh, we have um, rising global CO2 emissions. And um, these rising global CO2 emissions suggest we've got an issue to deal with here. And um, if you have heard that we need to reduce our emissions in order to um, uh, deal with climate change, then take a look at this graph and take a look at about where 1990 emissions are, and then figure that we need to go to about half of those emissions in the next few years. We have a lot to do. We have a really big agenda ahead of us. So, um, I also want to quickly point out in the first few slides, we'll give you a little bit of the science behind climate change. Although I'm a political scientist, it's helpful, I think, to have this background. 
And what we see here is that the carbon dioxide emission levels that we have uh, today are something that we haven't seen at least in 800,000 years, according to ice probes that have looked into the amount of carbon in the atmosphere in the last 800,000 years. And the assumption is we haven't seen the level of carbon dioxide we have now for the last four million years. And so we're already out of a norm. And the question is, can we uh, adapt or can we stop the rise of these emissions? So very recently, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was started in 1988, it was brought together by the world scientists to look at the um, uh, science on climate change, what do we know about climate change, and they came out with a, a report that said, time to wake up. Time for action is now. Um, and the reason is that our CO2 emissions continue to grow globally pretty rapidly, and that if we want to keep temperatures within a level where we believe it's still a range where humans can adapt, then we only really have a few years left. And if you look at what they say, they say global CO2 emissions must peak by 2025. That's three years from now. And then they have to drop by 43% of 2019 levels. That's the same level as we have today, basically. They basically have to be in half of what we had in 2019 levels. So go back to this graph. Basically, 2017, it's a little bit higher than that. And more or less, we have to go back to half of the level of 2017 by end of this decade. Sounds like a big challenge, and it is a big challenge. But the reality is, if we don't meet this challenge, we also are going to have a lot of other challenges. And here on the left, the spikes that you see is the global, from the Global Flood Database, where they are looking at just how much uh, damage is done through flooding, the cost that comes to, from flooding, and uh, the assumption is that climate change is leading to more extreme storms and more extreme events. We saw that here in Germany um, with the flooding uh, in the Ahr River. Um, a huge amount of damage, human lives lost, etc. And the graph, or the map, it shows you how temperatures are changing over time. And I'll leave this graph with you, and you can do a click on this, and you can see how temperatures have been increasing over the last um, uh, several years. And, and the concern here is not just an average temperature increase globally, but a concentration in temperature increase in the poles, in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, which means that we have a rapid melting of sea ice. And of course, that is leading to um, sea level rise. In fact, um, uh, estimates are that in areas around northern um, Germany, they're already measuring um, on the millimeter order per year of sea level rise. So if you add that up over 10 years time and you're getting two to three millimeters of increase, over 10 years time, that's a substantial increase in sea level rise. So, what does this mean? It means we have big challenges in front of us. And we also have the geopolitics around us. The Russian war in Ukraine, a horrific development. None of us, or most of us, didn't see it coming. Although there were a few voices trying to wake us all up. And um, the reality is it shows us that our climate change problem is maybe also related to some geopolitical issues. In fact, our fossil fuel dependency, you could say, has a connection to the Ukraine war.
And certainly this war in the Ukraine will have huge geopolitical consequences. It is going to impact a lot of decisions in terms of energy, resources, and climate politics. Um, so that is background. And now a little bit more, where are we when we look at this comparatively? So global CO2 emissions are um, something that has multiple dimensions to it. There's historic emissions, and historically, the biggest emitters are North America, Europe, and Japan. Um, you should know also greenhouse gas emissions stay in the atmosphere. So when you release the CO2 emissions, it's up there for several hundred years. When you release methane emissions, it's up there for about 25 to 30 years. When you emit fluorocarbons, they may be up there for thousands of years. So what we've emitted in the past is still there, except for some of the methane, right? Um, and on top of that, we have new emissions. So the new emissions we see here, these are the global emissions in 2019. And you can see that um, there's a couple of big emitters. China is 28, now 29% of global CO2 emissions. United States, 15% here. India, 7%. And actually, the European Union. Um, it's interesting to always ask why sometimes EU is presented as EU and why sometimes it's presented as countries. If we had the EU here, it would be about 10% of emissions. Russian Federation, 5%. So the big emitters today have a lot of responsibility. And we can also look at this in another way because it's important for how developing countries look at the world. Developing countries like India might say, yeah, we're 7% of global emissions, but on a per capita level, our emissions are really limited. So down on the bottom, it's a little hard to see here, but here, this is India. And you have a per capita emission of 1.7 tons of carbon per person. And then you go over to China, and China is 7.1 tons of carbon per person. Germany, not that much more. Germany is 7.8 tons of carbon, so China's almost caught up to Germany. And the United States is 14 and a half. So we have fairly big differences on the per capita level. And the reality is, Countries like India, South American countries are going to want to grow. That means that countries that have a lot of CO2 emissions are going to be expected to reduce their emissions a lot. Now, Lena, when we started this, we said we were going to do three decades. And then I realized, actually, we have to go back a little bit more than that. In the 1987 Montreal Protocol, it's not the first thing that happened, but it's the first big international agreement that was organized to deal with atmospheric pollution problems. And the Montreal Protocol is today actually one of our most important agreements for dealing with climate change, in part because we have several uh, gases that are bad for ozone that are also bad for climate. And so chlorofluorocarbons are regulated by the Montreal Protocol. And very recently, a few years ago, an amendment to the Montreal Protocol is now dealing with hydrofluorocarbons. I know, tough words. Um, but essentially, with an agreement that was designed to deal with stratospheric ozone depletion, we've, we got the first international attempt to also, in a way, deal with climate change, or at least some of the gases that cause climate change. But the literature tends to focus attention on the 1992 Rio de Janeiro conference. 1992 conference, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, 
It was not the first UN global conference on the environment. That was already back in 1972. But this was the first one that had a big focus on climate change. And it led to a global agreement called the Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Framework Convention is the basis for everything else that comes afterwards. The Kyoto Protocol is a protocol to the convention. The Paris Agreement is an agreement to this convention. And so they're linked to each other. And simultaneously, we had the Biodiversity Convention, Forest Principles, which really were um, the beginning of the idea, let's just have voluntary statements, and Agenda 21, an idea, let's start thinking not only about climate, but about other sustainability issues. Like I said, I have to cover a lot of time. Um, so I'm gonna jump really quickly through some of these slides. You may have heard of the Kyoto Protocol, formulated, uh, they started to formulate it already in the 1992 conference, 1995 here in Berlin, a super important conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and that's when they really said, okay, we need, we need an agreement that has targets. And that became the Kyoto Protocol. It took a long time to get the Kyoto Protocol ratified. It was first ratified in 2005, and various countries signed on to it. The EU made a commitment, the US made a commitment, Japan made a commitment, Russia basically said, yeah, we're on board, but because our economy collapsed, we're not gonna have to do any emission cuts. The problem is that the Kyoto Protocol ended up um, not working. It worked for Europe, but it didn't work for the rest of the world. Why? Because the United States signed it, but never ratified it, and then withdrew from it. And then later Canada withdrew from it. And so it worked for Europe because Europe decided to keep pushing with the agreement, and Europe met its commitments, but it didn't work as a global agreement. And when in 2001, Canada pulled out of the agreement just the days before the agreement was coming to an end, it basically was an indication of a, a structure that wasn't working. And the argument for why it wasn't working is that the developing countries weren't expected to participate in the agreement. And basically, by the developing countries, for Europe and, the, and especially the United States, that meant China. China wasn't expected to reduce emissions, but Chinese emissions were growing rapidly. I'll be more critical of the US in a little bit. 2012, 20 years after that um, United Nations conference in Rio de Janeiro, the world came together and said, we keep forming all these new agreements. Maybe what we need to do is just step back and see where we are and what we, do we need to do to implement things better. And there was a big push on the idea of maybe we need to focus more on how we can do green economic growth. How can we do a green economy? There were hopes that this would be the beginning of the formation of a global agreement. It wasn't quite there. But it did lead to discussions around the idea of the sustainable development goals, which I think you're gonna be learning a lot more about in this ring for Lazel. The sustainable development goals, you will see, although I'm sorry I have the German version here, that number 13 is climate change. And you might ask, why is it number 13? Why isn't it number one? Well, because a lot of developing countries were saying, you know, climate change, yeah, but we didn't cause the problem. We're being impacted by it, but we have people who are poor and hungry and who are dying of disease. And you can't expect us to be working on climate change if you're not willing to be thinking about our needs. So the sustainable development goals became a way of 
focusing more attention also on the needs, especially of the developing countries. But for the developing countries to also say, um, in the past we had Millennium Development Goals, and that was all about what the developing countries needed to do. The Sustainable Development Goals are what we all need to do. Everybody needs to work on these rich and poor countries. So that in, was all in background to the Paris climate negotiations. And the Paris climate negotiations, um, they were actually supposed to have been su successful in 2009. There were many, many conferences and the hope had been in 2009 that we would get a global agreement. Didn't happen in Paris finally. And the Paris Agreement has a couple of different targets. It's rather unusual in an international agreement that you have different targets. You have a two degree target and you have a 1.5 degree temperature target. And you can ask why? It's because the countries couldn't agree on what the target should be. The rich countries basically said a two degree target sounds like something we might be able to do in order to keep our emissions in check. And the small island countries and many coastal countries said for us, two degrees centigrade temperature increase could actually mean the end of our future. If you're Tuvalu, if you're the uh, Maldives, if you're Bangladesh, two degrees centigrade temperature increase could mean that you're underwater. And so, those countries said, if you want us to be on board, you have to have 1.5 degrees centigrade. And they made a compromise and they said, we're going to keep temperature increases to well below 2 degrees centigrade and to strive for 1.5 degrees centigrade. And the agreement also was mm, unable, the, the, the negotiators were unable to agree on a, a legally binding agreement. So instead they came up with nationally determined contributions. Basically the idea that countries would say what they think they're capable of doing and willing to do and then we'll add it up together and somehow figure out how we get to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. Fortunately the European negotiators managed to get another clause in there that said every five years we're going to look at the state of the science and see if our nationally determined contributions are enough. They're not. And that five-year conference was actually supposed to happen in 2019, but because of corona, it got pushed to 2020. Finally, the developing countries said, all of this is dependent on us getting financial and technological assistance to deal with the impacts of climate change and help us to follow a different development path. Three years after the Paris Agreement, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with the next report. It was the special report on 1.5 degrees. And the report warned, we're already at about one degree warming. This is 2018. And that if we want to stay within the 1.5 degree limit, then sometime soon we have to really reduce our emissions because we don't have so much time left. COP26. COP26 happened in November of 2021. And COP26 was for us um, an effort to look back to see what have we accomplished with the Paris Agreement and is it enough? Well, at the Glasgow conference, we had some progress. The United States and the European Union um, recognized that things aren't going fast enough, but that some steps could be taken to make, for, to make some quick reductions. And one way to do that is to focus on greenhouse gases that are not as um, big in, in quantity in the atmosphere, 
but that are very strong in their global warming potential. So methane is much stronger as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And then the EU and the US said, okay, let's start to tackle methane. And they agreed to do this. And we started to see some interesting arrangements emerging between rich and developing countries. One example is that Germany is now working with South Africa on a coal club. South Africa is a developing country that doesn't have very big per capita emissions, but it's still a top 20 emitter globally. It's got a big population. And the, the idea here is, can we help South Africa shift out of coal early enough that it doesn't become a super big emitter? And that's the idea of this coal club between Germany and South Africa. And we've started to see various agreements, here is just one I listed, um, uh, to stop climate harmful, harmful investments. So you've probably heard of divestment. It all started around South Africa, actually, the idea of divesting from an economy that was engaged in apartheid. And now the divestment movement is trying to do the same thing and say, let's get our companies, let's get our governments, let's get our pension funds out of investments that are bad for climate. The biggest success happened before Glasgow. The Norwegian pension fund has agreed to stop funding um, carbon intensive industries. Another, agreement from the developing countryside to stop deforestation by 2030. Probably not quite enough because there'll still be a lot of deforestation until then, but a step in uh, at least a somewhat positive direction. But very important is the US-China bilateral agreement to strive to keep within 1.5 degrees centigrade during this decade. The big question will be, can we do it? Funding for developing countries, yep. One where we weren't so lucky, phase out of conventional motors. There was an effort by several countries to say, we now have initiatives to phase out coal. I'll come to that in a minute. Why don't we have an initiative, a global initiative for agreement to phase out the conventional motor that is based on gasoline? That didn't work. Um, countries, including Germany, United States, Japan, and Korea are not on board. And of course, they are the big car producing companies. So, um, where are we? Well, already before Glasgow, a movement started that got new momentum behind it. And those are the climate neutrality targets. And this is something I think is kind of cool. We see more and more countries, and Wikipedia, we have this big list of countries that have agreed to achieve climate neutrality, but with different target dates. So the EU was an early mover here with a 2050 target. Germany had a 2050 target until we had the constitutional court decision that said we're not doing enough and then the government changed the target to 2045. Sweden is 2045, Finland 2035, Uruguay on the bottom 2030. So we have more and more countries that are saying, yes, climate neutrality is a target. So that's a good thing. But now let's take a look at what does it look like inside some of the big players. So realistically, without the US, Europe, and China, it's not gonna happen. US, Europe, and China to get, together are more than 50% of global CO2 emissions. So if these three blocks can do it, then the rest of the world can do it. If these three blocks can't do it, it'll be hard to convince the rest of the world to do it. It doesn't mean the rest of the world isn't important, but I can't cover everybody today, so I'm gonna focus in on just these blocks. And what you see here is um, what I call the energy divide in the United States. On one side, you see four pictures, and I'll say that's the Democratic side. 
where uh, you have way back in the 70s with the energy shortage uh, caused by the OPEC oil embargo, Jimmy Carter saying, put on a sweater, save energy. And he put the first uh, photovoltaics on the roof of the White House. And we had Al Gore as vice president and saying, um, we need a global agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, let's go for it. Or Obama, who was championing also the idea of a global agreement and going off to India and to China to arrange bilateral deals to say, look, if you do this, we'll do this, and then we can go together and uh, work on climate change. But on the other side of the screen is the Republican side. And the guy in the top carrying the cat is James Inhofe. James Inhofe is a very powerful senator who was a, the head of the Committee on Climate Change in the time of the Republican Congress, but he didn't believe in climate change. So it's kind of hard when the head of the Senate Committee himself doesn't believe in climate change. You can see his tweet here. The idea that man-made gases, CO2, are causing catastrophic global warming is the greatest hoax ever per perpetrated on the American people. And George Bush Jr. was president at the time I decided to come to Germany, in part because I was working at a university in the United States around Washington, D.C., and you couldn't even talk about climate change. It wasn't accepted to, you, you couldn't work on it um, with any kind of federal funding. And um, it was a very, very challenging time to, to deal with climate change. It was the George Bush administration that pulled the United States out of the Kyoto Protocol. And of course, you probably all remember Donald Trump. Donald Trump digs coal, as you can see here. He too was very much supported by the fossil fuel industry and states that are dependent on fossil fuels. So I'm not gonna go into a long discussion of Donald Trump other than to say that during his administration, he pulled the United States out of the Paris Agreement and he tried to weaken or roll back 100 environmental agreements. Some people say 200 environmental agreements. I've never counted. Behind Donald Trump is the social movement, the Tea Party, which uh, basically is a party that wants government out of industry. It's not a party, it's part of the Republican um, um, Party. And they have been heavily supported by uh, fossil fuel interests like the Koch brothers. So yeah, I already mentioned that Trump rolled back a lot of environmental agreements here, just a list of some of them. In the meantime, Joseph Biden is president. Joseph Biden um, has a very different politics than Donald Trump did. So whereas George Bush Jr. or Trump were saying climate change is bad for the US economy, it's bad for jobs, it's bad for uh, competitiveness. Biden said we need to be part of the global agreement, we need to be part of the Paris Agreement. And he canceled the American equivalent of Nord Stream 2. The American equivalent of Nord Stream 2 was the Keystone Pipeline, bringing fossil fuels from the Canadian tar sands down into the United States to help um, uh, the southern states um, uh, yeah, process the fuel and then sell the fuel. So this was canceled. He also canceled um, uh, mining in the Arctic. Under the Biden administration, the United States went to Glasgow and said the U.S. would cut greenhouse gas emissions 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels in 2030. A lot of numbers. What does it mean? I'll get to that in a minute. Biden has also called for a 100 percent carbon pollution-free power sector, that's electricity, by 2035. 
and the net zero economy by 2050. 100% carbon pollution free in the United States means renewables and nuclear energy. Um, but that was, that is the goal. The question is, is it enough? First is the question, um, yeah. So we have current policies um, of uh, trying to go below uh, uh, 2005 levels. The current policy was 17 to 25%. You see that Biden says we need to go 50 to 52% below. So that's that emission gap that's being talked about here. So the US Paris Agreement you see on the bottom, that's where we were at the beginning of the Biden administration. So that's the gap that Biden is trying to fill. In order to do that, there are two really big environmental packages or policy packages. The first really big package has passed. It's called the infrastructure bill. It is much smaller than Biden wanted it to be, but it is still huge. And it's, uh, it's over a trillion US dollars, that's a lot of zeros, a trillion US dollars to invest in roads and bridges and rail and uh, infrastructure for water and high-speed internet. It's all about infrastructure. We have something similar in Europe, um, but more focused like grid infrastructure. So that is all included in this package. And this bill was passed by Democrats and Republicans, so it's a bipartisan bill. It has some things for climate change in it. Rail transport, um, more efficient um, uh, public transport. So it has elements of climate change in it, but it's not the real climate change bill. The real climate change bill is called the Build Back Better plan. And this has not passed. This bill is stuck in the US Congress because of two senators, one who doesn't like it because it is uh, too expensive and because it hits the coal industry and Joe Manchin is from the coal state of West Virginia. The other senator is more concerned about the healthcare dimensions of the bill. So the Build Back Better plan is essential for the US to be able to meet the Biden-Glasgow target. Without this, it will be very difficult for the US to meet the target. So what is Biden doing in the meantime? He's doing exactly what Donald Trump did, but on the other side. He's passing executive orders. He passed an executive order where he's making all agencies look at climate adaptation and what they need to do in their fields. He's doing executive orders to gather information about the impacts of migration on the United States. Um, he's rolling back the rollbacks from the Trump administration. Uh, very recently, 19th of April, restoring climate safeguards in key environmental laws. Basically saying that you have to do environmental impact assessment on big projects. But the US courts have just said that Biden cannot stop oil and gas drilling in federal lands. And so we will start to see more oil and gas drilling in federal lands. And because of the Ukraine war and rising prices, just before the November elections in the United States, there is a push on the Biden administration to get more oil and gas into the market so it'll be cheaper. So we have some developments that aren't so great here. Yes, US states are doing a lot. I looked what all is going on in the last days. The US states are still trying to, to show climate leadership. Um, but while emissions dropped in the US over time, and they dropped a lot in the uh, COVID days, they're starting to go up again. 
And um, what is good news, the share of coal in the US um, market is declining. That's the line on the top. And the share of renewables, which is purple here, is also going up. But there's still a lot to be done. So I have five minutes left for the EU and China, no problem. Where is the EU at? Well, the EU likes to think of itself as a climate leader. And in some ways it is, and in some ways it's not. So where the EU has been pretty good is in terms of uh, moving forward on development of renewables in the electricity sector. There's a lot of other areas where it hasn't done enough. We have seen goals changing in Europe. So I have different colors here. 2014, black. Everything that's listed in black are the goals from 2014. Everything that's listed in blue are the goals from 2018. And in red, the goals of 2021. You can see that the goals have been increasing. The EU does increase its targets with new science. And the EU, like I said, has a climate neutrality target of 2050. The European Union has also introduced some ideas that should take us in, in new directions that are, are hopeful. And it's saying if we want to deal with climate change, then we can't just look at greenhouse gases. We have to look at the big picture of the economy. And we have to actually get away from an economic structure that is resource dependent and that is consuming more and leading to more garbage and more waste and that also contributes to emissions. So the European Green Deal is an effort to say we need to tackle climate change, we need to tackle our resource use, we need to move towards a circular economy, we need a new structure for our economy. Under the Green Deal, some of the uh, policy instruments that Europe uses to try to reduce its emissions have been intensified. So the European Union uses something called an emissions trading system to get companies to um, uh, invest more in, in energy efficiency or in renewables. You have to pay a price to pollute, basically, and so you have an incentive to invest in, in, in cleaner energy. So the EU is in the process of expanding this system to cover more sectors like marine transport, airlines, um, and it's also starting to say we need to, to reduce um, how much as a whole everybody is allowed to pollute so that the price of polluting becomes more expensive. And the EU has all kinds of new laws it's passing. One of them is the um, circular economy package. It's basically saying um, Europe imports almost everything, and yet we throw out so much. We really need to recycle and reuse and reduce and to build in ways that we're not using um, materials so inefficiently. Energy efficiency, which is basically all about information. But now we have that other part that I wanted to talk about, and that's where Europe's maybe not doing so well, and where we've allowed ourselves to be a little bit blind to reality. And the war on, our, on Ukraine shows us that. Europe is remarkably dependent on imports of fossil fuels, and a lot of that's coming from Europe, uh, sorry, from, from Russia. A lot of European fossil fuel imports are coming from Russia. We can look at it um, fuel by fuel. Um, for Germany, we know that very intensely. Germany imports almost all of its oil and gas and 60% of the gas that we're importing has been coming from Russia. Um, a, a large share of the oil that we're importing is coming from Russia, and even a large share of the coal, the hard coal we use, is coming from Russia. So for Europe as a whole, we've been confronted by a reality that we've allowed ourselves to say we're doing well on climate change, but we haven't been looking 
at what we've been doing in the fossil fuel area uh, outside of the renewable electricity sector. And we um, allowed ourselves to believe that dependency on Russia would actually be good for integrating Russia into the European Union, or at least into the economy of trade. And I'll admit, I believed it too. I really thought that an integration politics would be a successful politics. But when you look at it now, what we see is our fossil fuel dependency has also helped to support dictatorships around the world. Um, the most recent, very obvious case of that is what's going on in Russia. So the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, a 10 billion euro project, just imagine if that money had instead been spent on renewable energy or on energy efficiency projects, um, but it wasn't. So what is now going on? Well, it's a politics in transition. I can't actually tell you all of what's going on because it's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. But we have a new gas politics emerging. The European Union is now investing heavily in other alternatives to Russia for gas. That includes LNG terminals that we be will be built here in Germany to import gas now from North America instead of from Russia. Um, it's looking at what can be done to uh, buy gas uh, and oil from, from the Middle East um, and uh, basically questioning how can we get out of fossil fuels more quickly. I hope that what um, I hear from some sides will not be the case. One thing I am hearing is, well, shouldn't this be a reason for us to stay with nuclear energy? Shouldn't this be a reason for us to maintain the nuclear power plants that we have? Um, I would, for a lot of different reasons, argue no. I don't think it'll happen here in Germany, but from what I get asked to talk about, just a couple days ago I was in a, a conference listening to all of the interests in, in renewing nuclear energy, um, it's a very strong movement right now. And my argument would include that a reason for not doing it, take a look at what's happened in the Ukraine, look at um, the Russian invasion into the Chernobyl um, nuclear site, look at the attack on the Zaboritsha nuclear power plant, and you can start to question, um, is that really the safe path to be going? But what I do hope is that the war in Ukraine will lead Europe to, to make that transition that is so desperate for climate change and is so necessary um, when you think about the, the lives being lost uh, in the Ukraine or in Syria or in so many other parts of the world um, to do a sh that shift we need to do away from fossil fuels. So, um, there are some good signs. There are plans for a revision here in Germany of the Renewable Energy Policy Act, a speed up of the installation of photovoltaics, speed up of renewable energy development, um, removal of some of the bureaucratic restrictions, um, a plan to ch achieve 100% renewable electricity by 2035. So, if this is implemented, it could be a big push in the direction away from, from the fossil fuels. And um, because I'm already at the 50 minute level, I'll stop now and I'll just have you guys think about, is there a role for the universities here? And I can tell you I was a little frustrated when I wrote a, a note to my university president when the Ukraine war started and I said, I think it would be an ideal time for you as president of a university to ask the entire university body, which is 40,000 people, what can we do together to save some energy right now? And what can we do to look for um, creative and innovative paths to make a difference? And unfortunately, that didn't get picked up. But if we as universities were to do that, it would pick a lot, it would have a lot of momentum we're big institutions, and we're actually some of the biggest energy users in most cities. So I leave that thought with all of you.
And if you have questions about China, I have some slides on it, but I'm going to stop so that I don't run totally over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention and for your precious insights. So now we'll uh, shift to the Q&A session with you. Uh, does anyone has questions related to what she just said? Yes, please, Liam, I'll just come after you with my micro. Um, thank you. Um, so the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres kind of described climate change as a race we're losing, but one that we can still win. What is your kind of view on this? Are we making bold enough actions to get there? Um, yeah. Um, you know, you, when you work in this field for a long time, um, the question is, how do you stay positive um, when a lot of things kind of look negative. And I think we don't have any choice but to stay positive because um, that's the only way to motivate change. So uh, we are moving too slowly. There's no doubt about it. Um, but windows of opportunity for change open up. And I think we have one right now. The war in the Ukraine is a terrible thing. And so we should take a crisis and turn out of that crisis and try to move in a better direction. And so um, what I think we need is in all sectors a willingness to start to really look and say, what can we do to make a difference? More renewable energy, more energy saving. You know, if each and every one of you goes home and says, I'm going to turn down my heat and I'm going to turn off my electricity a little bit more, it's a small step in the right direction. Better yet, convince your institution to do so, because that impacts a lot of people. We are seeing some uh, real efforts now uh, in terms of what's going on with European politics, Joseph Biden's politics. We also need political voice. We need people to say, we need this to happen. So people need to speak up um, to show they care enough about it to make it happen. Um, there are a lot of new uh, technologies that are emerging that also have a lot of um, potential to them. But I think uh, what I often say to my, my students is, Think about it now. You guys have a chance to do something different than your parents. And you have a chance to do um, things in, in a way that will be much cleaner. Uh, it will lead to a, a much more equal global structure. So um, I can only ask all the young people in the room to push hard, and those of you who are older, to support them in the process. Um, there are some interesting new initiatives also to try to create uh, new movements for the over 65s to support the young people in making this change. So I'll flip the question back to you. Do you think we can do it? <laughs> it takes a lot, but it's possible. So that's right. Let's work on it together. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll switch to the next question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the, the lecture. Uh, I have a question which entails a little bit to the fact that I come from the third world. I'm a, a native citizen of Brazil. And for that very reason, I ask something. Uh, we know that usually the strongest stances when it comes to international discourse and to international geopolitics, when it comes to the, like taking actions against climate change usually comes from smaller players in the big field. For example, it's usually island states with a very big interest uh, in which they perceive an existential threat into not achieving the targets, and also uh, climate and environmental activists. In Brazil, for example, 
those activists usually have no institutional support whatsoever, and they are often the victims of persecution and crimes. And so for that very reason, uh, is there any possibility that we as a community can help those smaller players make big plays in the field of fighting climate change? Um, yeah, so, so smaller players in the developing world and, and in other places are um, super important. Um, Brazil is, a, is an amazingly important country in the climate negotiations as well, or in, in climate action, in part because, um, one, on the one hand, uh, Brazil is a leader in, in renewable energy. On the other hand, it is a big problem in terms of deforestation. And so we need the voices of people in Brazil and other developing countries where transitions are starting to pick up and going faster um, uh, because we need those voices to also uh, speak for climate and speak for, for environment. There are some efforts to assist uh, movements in, in places around the world, Germany has been very active in that. But we see another development right now that also makes me nervous, and that's the question of democracy. Um, so uh, you'll see my political colors here, but I was um, grateful that we didn't have a far-right election win in France because of concerns about what would that mean for um, climate? What would that mean for Europe? Um, I think that what we need to also uh, think about is how do we make sure that populism and far-right extremism doesn't become uh, a, a total hindrance to free speech? Um, in Russia, we have seen that support for um, uh, civil society organizations has been cut. Um, groups out of Germany that were working in Russia are no longer there. They're not allowed to operate there. We've seen similar developments in China um, where we have uh, restrictions on, on um, some organizations working there. So I think the other thing that we really need to do for climate is also work for democracy. Now I can, okay. <laughs> if I can also ask two questions on these lines, actually. The first one is, how can we put together then the right of developing countries to develop economically and achieving um, important steps in carbon emissions reduction? And the second one is, we have authoritarian regimes, for instance, China and Russia, that most probably care maybe less than other regimes about um, the, um, so to say, the um, reputation that they may have if they don't, if they fail to achieve um, this kind of goals. So how to also cope with, with this fact? Yeah, so um, the question about how do we deal with authoritarian regimes, um, uh, Basically, I think we need to stand up against them. And that may also mean that we need to think about our economic uh, structures and, and how we're developing economically. So you were asking um, about developing countries and shouldn't they have the right to develop? Of course they should have the right to develop. And of course they should have the right to a um, more comfortable life than, than is available in many developing countries right now. And the question is why don't they have that? Why do we have continued economic inequalities at massive levels today? Um, it's, I think, because a lot of our uh, economic structure today isn't uh, accounting for the negative externalities, um, the pollution, the health problems. Um, we're not paying uh, prices that make it um, uh, possible for farmers in, in developing countries to actually have reasonable lifestyles. Um, so there's many, many things we need to re-look at. And I think the Green Deal in Europe is a step in the right direction. I think the Green Deal is starting to say 
we need to be thinking about um, where are our resources coming from because a lot of how we've been growing economically until now is on the backs of developing countries where we don't um, look at the cost of, of mineral resource mining or the cheap imports that we have. Um, big questions, big questions. Um, but I think a lot of us as consumers can make a difference too, where you think about what are we buying and why are we buying the really cheap textiles that are causing a lot of pollution in different parts of the world. Um, shouldn't we be in more sustainable as consumers? Um, so a lot of movements we need, a lot of it needs to happen simultaneously, but those movements are starting. So the United Nations has a big push right now, for example, on textiles. And we will start hearing a lot more that the textile industry is actually one of, the, one of the biggest polluting industries in the world. It uses water, it uses energy, it uses chemicals, it pollutes with plastic um, in the oceans. And, and so small steps can make for big changes. Okay, I think this is then yes. my turn, I guess. Um, it's right here. Ah, yes, okay. <laughs> Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for the very insightful lecture and already uh, the answers that you gave. Um, I actually have a lot of questions, but I will reduce myself. And it comes to the, the term of transformation because it's such a big word and I think nobody's really actually defining what it means in so far um, that, for example, Schott and Kanger in 2017 or 18 have defined it as like, uh, the movement of various socio-technical systems in the same direction. And you've already um, uh, talked about energy, you talked about consumption, and I was just wondering, do you think that um, these, various uh, these various directions are encapsulated within the current architecture of the global climate governance, or is it more of a thing that we as individuals or as nation stage or sub national actors should pursue. Thank you. Yeah, that's another big question. Transformation, what is it? Um, I think we can go back, for example, to the Brundtland Commission that was calling for forms of development that leave similar opportunities for next generations to have um, uh, comfortable lifestyles. Um, to, to what we have had, or at least wanting to, to give them those chances. Um, I think that our current system and the climate uh, negotiations are, are built on the current system. They're looking for efficiency improvements and reductions through technological change within our current system, plus some changes towards, for example, more renewables. What I think we need um, is the deeper transformation. And that deeper transformation means that we have to really think about what's the basis that our economies are structured on. And right now, our economies are structured on a lot of things that are not sustainable and that cause a lot of inequalities in the world and are likely to lead to more problems if we don't address them. So. Um, you know, you, you've heard terms like sufficiency or degrowth or I don't think we're going to, we had this discussion before um, with the students that were interviewing me and I said, I don't think we're actually going to manage a degrowth, but we certainly need to manage a, um, a sustainable growth and that means that there's got to be a, a much, much broader decoupling between resource use and, and growth. And maybe we need to rethink what we use as a measure of, of well-being, um, and that well-being uh, should be much more focused on uh, you know, quality of life and health and education, and much less on um, uh, tink tink capital dollars. But um, systems, uh, these capitalist systems are also very strongly embedded and um, I don't think that's going to change so easily. Um, thank you for your presentation over here. Oh. Um, 
I was asking myself, is it actually governments conducting progress on climate action or aren't they only reacting on public and scientific pr uh, pressure? So in, sh in short, is institutionalism the best approach to advance to towards a sustainable future? Um, I think as individuals we can make impacts. I think as individuals we can um, help to move towards more sustainable consumption patterns, etc. But if we don't have institutional change, it's hard to get mass change. And we always see in almost every society, somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of people um, are by nature just um, good at, at turning off the lights and being sustainable consumers. But a lot of people either don't have the interest or the time um, to do it. And, and that's where institutions matter. Institutions are laws, institutions are programs, and those institutional structures, um, if we can embed within them concepts of climate change and sustainability, then as societies, I think we can, we can make those changes. We've seen it to some extent already, right? So, so we've got laws and policies and programs that are starting to, to lead us in new directions. Um, renewable energy development or um, uh, plastics that we're, we're now not supposed to have one-way plastics. Um, those kinds of changes can have big impacts. So I think we need to really think about how we can use the state to help us shift some of our policy directions. Um, but to do that, we need public voice and we need public dialogue to talk about these things. Uh, can I answer that question? No. Yeah, okay. Okay, then I use it. I'm, I'm from back from times when I took here in inorganic chemistry. In the 60s, this kind of thing was not needed by the professors. It was not used. And they spoke, and we as students understood. Um, I admire your youth because I'm an old man. Uh, I must admit that I turn 84 next month. So you can imagine th that I look much further back than you do, and I start thinking further back than you do. And all what you presented, I hate to tell you, is, a, is only a repetition of false political promises, which never held what they pretended to say it was just political visions without any content and anything behind. As a matter of fact, uh, one month ago, I uh, uh, borrowed a book here from our library over there from 1971. And this book I had to bring f uh, for that I could take it from the archives because it is so old that they stored it in the archive here of the uh, university. And this book from 1971, uh, uh, with the title, A Planet Goes Rot, that was the title at that time. We had others uh, like, uh, does this blue planet die? Question mark. And the answer was yes, in 74. So uh, you start too late uh, with your uh, memories. I start earlier. I was already in the United States and held uh, an assistant professorship uh, in, back in 66. And um, I work since 50 years with the Federal Environmental Agency Umweltbundesamt here in Berlin. And I have a tremendous amount of um, experience. And the matter of fact is that this uh, fellow Reimer with that book from 71, uh, uh, the last chapter said, looking forward 30 years and 50 years. That's where we are now. 
And you know what he said? He, he was fully right, only that he overestimated the speed of the climate change because he thought that already by the year 2000, the Antarctic ice shield might melt. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in into what you're saying because I think I know where you're coming from. Um, uh, there, are cl there are clearly a lot of voices that have been speaking on threats to the planet much longer. The 1972 conference um, was all about uh, pollution and loss of species and resources. But um, back in 1972, the science of climate change was just beginning and there was no political understanding of climate change. So the targets that I've talked about here, you are right that many of them are targets and many of them have not been implemented. Um, so we can also ask about international agreements and what role do they play. I think international agreements are still important because they help to raise awareness and to build consensus. The challenge is getting them implemented into national policy and then getting that policy to also be implemented. So that's a little bit why I wanted to introduce some of the difficulties we're seeing in the United States right now. Um, if the Biden administration can push through its second package, then I think we might actually, between Europe and the United States, be moving in the right direction. If the Biden administration fails to do it and we end up having a shift back to a uh, climate skeptic government in the United States, then I think it's going to be a much more challenging issue. So I appreciate you know, all the work that you've done in this field and that there were voices already a long time ago. For me, um, I've been working on this issue since the late 1980s, and um, I can say it has been a, a roller coaster ride of hope, disappointment, hope, disappointment. Um, there have been a lot of changes. When I started, there weren't that many people working on it. Now, there's a lot of people working on it, so that's a good thing. Um, but we see how hard institutional and cultural change is, and that we need to keep working on it. I say, I'm saying what I think is the truth. So this is, this is my understanding. Yeah, there's some other uh, questions back here. We are gonna move here. to the next yeah. question, please. Uh, are there any more questions? Besser so? Danke. Um, what, what do you think, where do you think the problem is? You haven't talked that much about technologies. Um, would you say that we, our technologies are sufficient in order to reduce um, CO2 emissions and to lower the temperature? And that we are lacking system, systemic approaches, like you talk a lot about politics, about economies, about um, activities. So are we not having a technology problem, but a political problem? Yeah, on the technological front, I think we do see a lot of um, possibilities in our existing technologies. So um, if you listen to the voices of the European Commission, if you listen to the voices of many policymakers, you will hear them say, we have the technologies we need to do it. And I agree. The question is, can we make those technologies even more efficient and more effective and cheaper? And that's critical for the developing countries because if the developing countries follow the path the rich countries did, if we have the same kind of industrial revolution that we've had for the last, let's say since the 1880s until now, uh-uh. If we continue to do our industrial revolution based on fossil fuels, no. Where I think technological change can make a big difference, um, but always with the need to do critical thinking around those new technologies. 
new materials that are much lighter um, uh, and stronger. Um, hydrogen fuels might be an opportunity if they're green hydrogen fuels so that you can bring along fossil fuel based countries like Saudi Arabia. Um, who otherwise might be difficult to bring along in this transition. Um, the development of um, digital technologies brings with it some problems, but maybe also many opportunities for the development of more effective and efficient systems. There is so much waste in our existing structures. How much electricity and fuel do we let waste because of inefficiencies? So um, I think with technologies, we can make some real improvements and, and hopefully Germany will play a big role here um, as a country that is strong in, in um, engineering and technologies. But again, always with um, the checks and balances and assessment of what kinds of risks might be e accompanying new technologies. We've seen in the past, we often make decisions and we don't think through the potential alternatives enough. Um, we went big scale into Nord Stream 2, and maybe if we had had more debate and discussion about it, we could have th thought about what other alternatives are there. So. Uh, next question. Um, I, I totally agree with, not financing fossil infrastructure like Nord Stream 2. Um, I totally agree also that there's a huge lack of the speed of decarbonization. Uh, and then I wonder why do you still come to the conclusion that these LNG terminals should be built? Est estimates are it's going to take four, five, some people say six years until they will be functioning. We all know they will import dirty fracking gas from the, from the US using water from Mexico. Uh, they will finance another dictatorship in Qatar. Uh, why should we build them? I think this is an excellent opportunity to phase out a huge part of oil imports and of gas imports. Of course, it's painful. The best argument I have heard why the German industry needs a cheap gas is to produce cheap uh, windows for cars. Well, the German car industry is also nothing we should save. Um, so, I think this is a great opportunity and we should ask uh, the government not to build these LNG terminals. Instead, we should invest all the money in renewable energies and using less fossil fuels. It's an excellent uh, chance now and uh, we should use it, I think. Yeah, um, my slide on, on what is happening with gas politics is not my saying this is what I want to happen. This was my reporting what is happening, that, that there are investments now going into LNG terminals. To be honest, I think it's also part of a larger politics, a, a deal that's being made between the United States and Europe on the security front tied to gas infrastructure. Um, but we do also have to recognize that there are some very uh, energy intensive industries in Germany that are dependent on gas. The glass industry, the steel industry, the automobile industry. And the question is, how do you transition away from that as quickly as possible without leading to massive unemployment, which will lead to massive uh, unhappiness and populism and lack of democracy probably too. So um, I think whenever we think about transition, we need to think of the big picture and really think about if we take step A, what could be the other consequences? So I appreciate very much what you're saying. Let's not build a whole new infrastructure around something we need to phase out. Um, the question is, how do we do that best? Are there any more questions? Okay. Um, so I appreciate your optimism about the Build Back Better Act. I'm a, I'm a U.S. student, so this is why I'm going there. But let's say that it doesn't get passed. I think the policy consensus about the U.S. government right now is that the Build Back Better Act is dead. Um, and if it comes back in any form, it will be much smaller. Um, and it's being negotiated by Joe Manchin. So probably not going to have uh, the impact that maybe we would like. 
So where do we go from there? Like, assuming that it doesn't come back, what happens um, with a lack of US policy action on that front? So I think the first thing we're going to see is an effort on the part of the Biden administration to um, salvage what it can out of that act and to introduce smaller pieces of legislation that um, will have climate positive implications. Whether or not that will get through the Congress is still an open question. Manchin has suggested he might be willing to do that. Um, the other big question is whether or not it can be done in time before the November election. And the November election, we don't know, of course, any election can go any direction, but um, pattern of midterm elections is whatever party has the presidency loses the midterm election. And so if that happens, then we will have gridlock in the United States. And the only thing Biden has left then is executive orders which can be turned over by um, any next president. So what we will probably see in that case is more of what we've seen over the last decades, a continued effort on the part of states and cities to try to make change from the bottom up, which is harder, but still can have some positive impacts. So um, I think one of the things that, that you learn over time is when, when you can't make change here, start thinking about where you can make change. And don't just stop. You know, find alternative actions, alternative paths to making change. And, and that's where the creativity comes in. Um, and you do start to see, um, you know, coalitions that form at local levels. And when you get enough local uh, cities to start to make a difference, it can put pressure on higher levels. So um, that can be an opportunity. And the other opportunity, the Republican Party used to be the party that passed environmental laws. So maybe we need to think about are there ways that parties that right now are opposed or resisting can be influenced to think differently. Uh, when we look at uh, the um, democracy and the challenge to implement the great transformation towards sustainability, um, what I am observing is governments being very, very reluctant about actually implementing strong policies. For instance, in Germany, uh, the Green Party, who is supposed to be the one to really push for uh, sustainability, still has this uh, trauma from, I don't know, around 2012 with the Veggie Day uh, and is now still t totally scared to um, use words as we will ban something, we will uh, actually uh, have stronger measures against something uh, because uh, of the fear of the, of the backlash. So, um, but like in order to need this, to in, in order to implement this uh, great transformation, uh, I mean, we need governments that actually lead, that go ahead, that don't just uh, wait until they have the support and then implement it, but uh, go ahead and uh, do it. So, um, in your opinion, uh, how can we achieve this shift of paradigms towards more confident governments that are uh, leading ahead? Yeah, good question. Um, I wish I had all the answers to all of your difficult questions. Um, but uh, I think something that you can say here is uh, we also need to better understand why there's so much resistance. And maybe that also means there's not enough dialogue and debate and discussion and uh, not enough discussion between groups with different opinions. Um, I do think government needs to lead, but I also think we need to understand why you have yellow jackets in France. And I think we need to understand why we have an AFD in Germany. And I think we need to understand why we have um, populism like we do in the United States. Um, there's, there's obviously um, something that's going wrong when big parts of society are um, so opposed to 
policies that obviously for the long term make a lot of sense. And, and so, yes, I think we need leadership. At the same time, I think we need um, more discussion and dialogue and trying to understand where have we been failing that we have, you know, how is it possible that democracy is being put at, th at risk? How is it possible that we have, um, uh, you know, in country after country now, um, the rise of, of um, authoritarianism within democracies? And that suggests to me we've been, we've been overlooking some really big issues for too long and we need to understand why. And all of that's necessary if we want to deal with climate change. Um, here, um, in your presentation and the questions, there's been a lot of talk about institutionalism and value-based negotiations out of concern for the planet, for future generations, but all those projections are also very fragile. We can only think about non-linearity and tipping points, and maybe the situation is really much more dramatic in 10 years uh, than we think it will be. Um, so what could be the scenario where um, these uh, consequences are much more immediate and the logic of cooperation is replaced by the sort of logic of coexistence. Um, because I've read some uh, literature about the securitization of the environment where it is not, um, it, it becomes a, an existential threat and then uh, countries start really acting against the climate crisis, but under a completely different tone and perspective where the issues of um, fighting this are depoliticized, um, social questions are let, let um, out of the table, but maybe it would be also a reason why countries in the North and South, illiberal and democratic, start acting, but as I said, out, out, of, um, out, of, uh, out of an existential threat, yeah. Yeah, um, I, think, I think the challenge here is um, if we wait until the climate change development is so bad that we get that sense of severe crisis, uh, we really will have a lot of tipping points that bring a lot, a lot of um, problems for, for humanity and, and for other species. So, so the question now is what can we do to prevent getting to that point where things are so existentially threatening that, um, you know, mass climate migration, et cetera. And um, coexistence, it's a wonderful idea. I'm totally behind it. I don't know how to get there. Um, when I look at what's going on now, I fear we're entering a new Cold War. It's a Cold War with Russia and maybe a Cold War with China. And so it's, things are moving in anything but the direction of coexistence right now. For you guys as a young generation, I can only say do everything you can to try to strengthen internationalism, to strengthen voice, to work together because we really need to think like a planet, um, but it's, right, it's hard right now. It's really hard right now. So if you have great ideas, bring them out because that's what we need. We need a lot of good ideas. Thank you. Um, thank you, Miranda. Thank you so much for this very excellent introduction into climate change politics and um, also for answering all the questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I wish we could stop with a more pessimistic note, but I think we all agree that not enough has happened um, during the last five decades and climate change is the field where most happened um, uh, regarding global environmental problems. Um, next week we will continue with biodiversity politics and especially forest governance. Yeah, the two fields are obviously related <laughs> because uh, global deforestation continues and this means also more global warming and more climate change. Um, so, yeah, this was the, I think, a very good start, <laughs> the first lecture of our lecture series. Um, again, thank you, Miranda. Thank you.